Welcome to the Women Want Strong Men podcast. I'm your host, Amy Stuttle. I believe it takes a strong man to appreciate a strong woman, and I'm here to bring a unique perspective to empower both sexes. I love talking with health experts, thought leaders, influencers, and people who have insightful information to share with us about our health, our society, and our pursuit for success and prosperity. Before we get started today, I wanted to point out that the guests come on this show for free. They don't charge me and I don't charge them. They are taking the time out of their schedule to educate you all for absolutely no cost. So if you enjoyed the content of one of the guests or learned something from them, please leave a review about the episode and tell us what you liked about it or share the show with someone that you think could also benefit from the content. Topics we cover on this show can literally change people's lives. So I just want to point that out, that the only way this show continues to grow is if you follow, rate, and share the show with family and friends. So on today's episode, I have Anna Griffith. She's a nurse practitioner here at Victory Men's Health. Anna also has her doctorate in nursing. Anna sees and treats a lot of patients that use weight loss medications such as semaglutide, which is also known as Ozempic or Wagovi, and Trizepatide, which is known brand name Monjero. So we are going to go through ways to optimize your weight loss journey while on these medications. We've already done several podcasts on why these medications are game changers in weight loss and how terrific they work. We see patients have life-changing weight loss success while using them. We have a lot of patients on them at Victory Men's Health, and we can't say enough positive things about these medications. So since we already covered how terrific they work, we're going to focus more on the frequently asked questions we get from patients. We're going to cover ways to mitigate some of the side effects from anywhere from nausea to muscle loss. And we're going to discuss some mistakes that we see made while using these medications. So Anna, let's get started here. And I think let's start with the side effects. What would you say is the most common side effect that you hear about from your patients while using this medication? There's a variety. Probably nausea is the most common thing that we hear about, but maybe not the most long lasting side effect or the most important side effect to talk about. Yeah. So how do you handle a patient that comes in with nausea from being on the medication? And when you say it's not a long lasting side effect, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so a lot of times people are having nausea in the first day or two after taking their first shot or after a dose increase. So these medications, we really personalize them for the person. For instance, when you look at the trademarked medications for these Ozempic, Manjaro, there's very specific dosing schedules for all of these medications where you're basically doubling the dose every month that you take them. When you look at compounds, the purpose of compounds is to do more patient-specific dosing because many people do experience side effects or have problems from medication. So being able to tell someone not to completely double the dose because that might not be the right thing for them, drawing it up themselves in an insulin needle as opposed to an auto-injector makes a big difference for being able to dose this for the individual. So usually someone is having nausea, one or two days after they take a shot. And a lot of times that goes away in the weeks following these medications once your body is getting used to them a little bit more. So if someone's having more severe nausea or if it's lasting for a long time and it's not going away, sometimes decreasing the dose is helpful, sometimes lower than the lowest dose, that's possible for some people. Also, some other things to consider. If you're having nausea because... Perhaps you haven't changed any of your diet. Maybe you are not eating enough. Maybe you are eating too much sugar or fried foods. A lot of these trigger foods, this medication should be a tool. It is not the entire equation. So we should always be counseling patients to be doing all of the right things. Because if you think, I'm just going to take this magic shot and this is going to just help me lose weight. I don't want to change anything in my lifestyle. I just want to take the shot and magically get skinny. That is not the game here. That is not the protocol. So a lot of times alcohol consumption, huge deal in these medications causing side effects. So those are the primary things I think about and ways to treat nausea. I think some other clinics or doctors are maybe a little bit 
too quick to say, just here, have a Zofran, an anti-nausea medication. Why treat a side effect with more medications when we could do some lifestyle changes? I think it's extremely rare that anyone under our care has ever gotten a prescription for Zofran. I think we've done it maybe a couple of times for patients that have just been really sensitive to these medications. Or inject the wrong dose. Exactly. Yeah. No matter how much education you give someone, you tell them to take 10 units and on accident, they take 100 units. Whoa, not good. So got to pay attention when your doctor is telling you what to do and read the vial because it's on 10 different pieces of paper. Yeah. Yeah. We have actually had somebody inject 100 units on their on their first shot versus 10, which, believe it or not, she didn't get nearly as sick as we thought she was going to get. So thank goodness for that one. But yeah, you're right that the medication does kind of expose a poor diet and that can lead to the side effect of nausea. And I've taken semaglutide and I would agree with you that the nausea was short lived for me. You know, it was maybe the first shot or two. And then after that, I was completely fine and didn't experience any nausea. And the nausea wasn't even debilitating. It was just like, "Mm, yeah, I don't know. That food doesn't necessarily sound good. I wasn't throwing up all day by any means. So you mentioned that you're not quick to prescribe like a Zofran. What are some like the natural remedies that you would recommend somebody take to decrease the nausea? Sure. So eating more small, frequent meals, Eating food in the right quantities, the right timing, definitely not eating too late at night can sometimes make a difference for people. Focusing on the right types of food, proper water consumption, all of that makes a difference. A few other natural things people sometimes will try are ginger, either lozenges or you can do like a ginger tea. Those are kind of the more common things that I think about. Okay, so what would you say is the second most common side effect that you see? So maybe not as much in our practice, but just in general with the use of these medications, muscle loss is a huge concern and why these medications have been demonized in certain health circles, I think. And so that's a really long conversation we can have if you want to direct me where to go with that. (laughs) Yeah, well, no, let's talk about it. I mean, maybe you can start with the in-body scale and what we're looking at and then how we educate through diet and protein intake and stuff like that. Absolutely. So If you are going to a doctor and you are trying to lose weight and you don't know where your muscle mass is and you don't know where your body fat percentage is, you're doing it wrong. You have to be getting these numbers. I do not care what your BMI is. I do not care what your weight is. Those do not equal any health outcomes for anybody. So BMI is the oldest tool in the book. It's okay for population-based studies. But this test is basically just looking at your height versus your weight. I have guys come in here all the time that have 10% body fat and their muscle mass is way through the roof and their doctor told them they need to lose 20 pounds. I think Steve over at our Wing Haven Clinic is like a perfect example of this. I think his body fat's at 7% or he's going to get mad at me because he's going to (laughs) text me and say it's at 5. But his BMI is always going to be really high. His visceral fat is low. So when you look at these different measurements, and you don't have to have a fancy scale to do this. Ideally, you have something that's measuring these and that can track it over time. We have the in-body scale here. And honestly, I know you've talked before in the podcast, some of the detailed labs we run, but I would argue almost that the in-body scale is the most valuable piece of data information we give to our patients because there is no one measurement that more highly correlates with health decline, poor health outcomes than a high visceral fat. Visceral fat specifically is the type of fat that surrounds your internal organs, like your liver and your intestines. So you can think about this also as waist circumference. So you can even measure this with just a measuring tape at home, measuring your hip to waist circumference. There's some equations you can look up online to figure out where you're at with that, what your ratios are. And on our in-body scale, it gives you a number zero to 20 usually. Some people are way over 20, but that's as high as our scale's reading right now. I think some of the newer scales maybe go up higher than that. So 10 or less on visceral fat is your goal because that is going to decrease your risk of having high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, sleep apnea, all these metabolic syndromes that are correlated with this fat content. Cancer even is correlated with high fat. So that is the main thing that you need to be working towards. And if we just look at calories in, calories out, 
a lot of people still advocate for that. And certainly it works if you're doing it for long enough for certain people, but it does not work for everybody because there's all these different diets out there. Kind of a newer one that a lot of my patients have been coming in and doing is Octavia, or I don't know how you say that, but same thing with in the past, a lot of people have done the HCG diet. All of these people will talk about how well that they worked, but then they couldn't maintain the results. Well, that's because you're eating 500 to 1,000 calories a day, and that is not sustainable, and you're not learning to do things that are lifestyle changes. So if you're just decreasing calorie amount, your body is going to get used to eating that low amount of calories, and then when you do eat higher amounts of calories, it's going to say, okay, this is feast time versus famine time. And then when you go back to famine, your body has adjusted to where you're not going to be able to get rid of those extra calories anymore because it thinks that now 800 calories is your baseline. Your body does not want to die. So it adjusts. This is evolutionary principles, basically, you know, so you have to adjust to where you can maintain your metabolic rate so that your cells don't die. So that's kind of the challenge with these yo-yo diets. People really screw up their metabolism. So you have to really do things correctly. And that's not, you know, a cookie cutter approach for everybody. Yeah, I do want to point out that I just recently had a DEXA scan and my in-body scale to my DEXA scan was only a 0.1% difference. Like they were almost identical. And I know that some people want to argue, well, the in-body scale isn't as accurate as a DEXA or this, that, and the other. It's like, nah, well, I don't know about that. I mean, I just did one side by side and they were pretty spot on. I love that because the DEXA is kind of the gold standard. And even between scales, there's some people that do an in-body at a different location and they'll see some different results. You'll see some variability in things day to day, time of day. So it is important to use the same scale probably for all of your follow-up to determine what progress you're seeing. But it's pretty darn accurate. The scale's really good. Yeah. And we don't necessarily celebrate weight loss here if you're also losing muscle mass. If you're just losing muscle mass, I mean, muscle mass is so critical to how we age and bone density and frailty and stuff like that. Like if you lose 20 pounds and it's all muscle, like that's not good. (laughs) That's not where you want to be. So let's talk about some of the tools that you use to make sure somebody keeps their muscle mass on. And even increase it because the reality is most people do not have high enough muscle mass. Yeah. So one thing to point out is the standard is that when you lose weight, about a third of your weight loss comes from muscle mass if you're just losing weight and not monitoring those things. And what's really frustrating to me is I recently few months ago, I listened to a podcast with one of these obesity experts at a major institution, and she put that information out there saying one of the hosts even said, well, should we worry about giving these to older people with, you know, the concern with muscle loss? And she basically said, well, there's nothing really you can do about it is her paraphrase. And that makes me so mad because you can absolutely do something about it. You can gain muscle while losing weight. That is body recomposition should be our goal because you're right. There's a lot of people that have way lower muscle mass than what is ideal for overall health. Sarcopenia increases your risk of going into a nursing home. That should be a major goal for all of us in life is to not end up in a nursing home. So um, the main ways we try to make sure we don't lose muscle or even gain muscle, we have to be giving people protein goals usually. Because you ask someone, well, what's your diet like? Some people are really hard on themselves and they say, my diet sucks. <laughs> it's really bad. Other times they're they're coming back and they're saying, oh, it, it's not too bad. My diet's really good. And then you, when you ask them, okay, break it down. Tell me specifically what you're eating. And it just ranges so much. And everyone eats. So we all think we're experts in nutrition, but there's so much diversity in what someone might need to be doing for their their health and their activity level. So specific protein goals, 0.7 to 1 grams of protein per ideal pound of body weight is the equation that I use. The RDA recommendation for protein intake is what you need to not die. That is not what we're doing for ideal health. A lot of people will talk about how that recommendation really needs to change. So 0.7 to 1 grams of protein per ideal pound of body weight, meaning your goal is to be 200 pounds and you want to gain muscle or really work to not lose any muscle, you need to be eating 200 grams of protein a day. So there's 
a lot of ways to do that. And sometimes it's we're making someone a meal plan. We have a great application to do that for people. Sometimes we're using supplements. Usually we're trying to get in whole food sources of these protein sources, but you also have to be active. Not everyone has to go to the gym. Some people are not gym people and that's okay, but we have to be doing something. Too much time is spent sitting down in front of computers and we have to counteract that somehow. So using bands at home, walking, using wrist weights, there's so much variety in that. Ideally, we're all doing some kind of weight training because that's extremely beneficial for our health, but you kind of have to meet the person where they're at. Okay, so let's talk about one last side effect and constipation. Yeah, that's definitely a very common side effect as well and a little bit more challenging, I would say, because usually when someone's experiencing it, it's because they've already had a lot of constipation in the past and now it's worsening. So commonly, a lot of people have already tried some things in the past or they're just not worried about it, which is also a problem. So we should be going to the bathroom every single day. If you eat every day, you should be going to the bathroom every day. If nothing is moving there, you cannot lose weight. You will not feel good. Loading is not comfortable. So there's a lot of natural remedies for constipation. Definitely we need to be moving. 8,000 steps a day is the minimum of what we should be doing for general health and for making sure everything's going to be digesting appropriately. So walking, really important. Definitely water intake. We should be drinking about half of our body weight in ounces is a good goal to have. So if you're 200 pounds, drink 100 ounces of water a day is a good goal. Fiber intake, really important. A lot of us are under eating fiber. Sources of fiber, a lot of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, seeds, nuts, Those are all really good sources of fiber. You can also use supplementation if you're not doing so hot with your diet, but always try to pack in the diet first. A lot of supplements out there usually have somewhere around four grams of fiber is a decent supplement to look for. We use one that's pretty common with has a lot of greens, fruits type blend in it, along with probiotics, which is helpful. You can also do a separate probiotic. Sometimes that's useful. And magnesium, specifically magnesium citrate, is a really useful constipation supplement out there. Some people are using stool softeners, colace, Miralax, that type of stuff too. Try to focus on the diet, exercise, and those things before you're really hitting yourself hard with laxatives to counteract the side effect if possible. Okay. And I'll attach these products that we use to mitigate some of these side effects in the show notes so they're easy for people to access. So let's move on to frequently asked questions that you get from the patients. So the first one is, what weight do I need to get to so I'm considered healthy? Yeah, this one's really interesting. I've had some patients that were either given a goal way too high or way too low for their composition. So one example of this is you have a female come in who has always been overweight her entire life, and she was told she needs to be X weight. And that amount of weight loss just seems insurmountable to her. And so she just gives up because if I can't ever reach that, if I can't be healthy, it's hard for me to even lose 10 pounds, let alone 115 pounds, then I'm just never going to get there. So that scale, again, is really helpful for making attainable goals for people because you can look at it and say, okay, you are at 40% body fat right now. Ideally, for women, you should be 18 to 28. And Maybe we don't need to get down to 18. That doesn't need to be the goal. Again, if someone has a lot of muscle mass, they are not going to need to lose as much weight as maybe their primary care doctor told them to or their personal trainer. I think I've had a few personal trainers tell people, you need to lose 130 pounds, and that's just mind-blowing for people. They can't, they, they can't even conceptualize how they do that. So we make a first goal or maybe a second goal and kind of work from there on what that ideal body composition is for them. So always giving them the goal on the visceral fat, working on decreasing that, and then a specific body fat percentage while maintaining muscle mass is is a primary goal. But that should be individualized for the person and based on their history. You know, if someone has 
history of an eating disorder or just has a really bad relationship with food or scales, maybe we're not checking that or looking that as much because maybe we're using this medication more for their mental health to not worry about it so much and to help them in their weight loss through a different avenue. And we have heard that before, that the medication has just changed people's relationship with food and it's not near as stressful day in and day out thinking about if I eat that, am I going to gain weight? Oh my gosh, how much can I eat? This, that, and the other. That there, you know, it was a very unhealthy relationship with food, very stressful for them to think about. And this medication has significantly relieved that stress. Yeah, yeah. And also looking at it from the other side. So if somebody is, low on body fat percentage. Specifically for men, there's not one number where they say, oh, you're at risk. So men usually say, I just want it to be as low as possible. But there are certain ranges where your body fat is so low that you are starting to feel fatigued. It could cause some hormonal imbalances, especially for women. You want to stay in that normal range. You do not want to be going lower than 18% body fat. That is not going to be good or helpful at that point for your health. That's really important to note as well. Okay. So the next question is, how quick will I gain the weight back if I stop using the medication? Will the weight stay off forever or do I have to take this medication forever? Yeah, this is a really important question to look at because a lot of the studies, pretty much all of the studies I think done on this, specifically on semaglutide, I think show that most people do gain their weight back after stopping taking it. A more recent study on Manjaro, I believe, showed that it wasn't as... Yeah, I just read it this morning that the placebo kept 9% of their weight off. On average, they lost 26%. And when the placebo group stopped the medication, I guess... It wouldn't be the placebo, it'd be the other arm, right? Well, no, they were on the medication and then they split the group and then that half became a placebo and the other half continued on. So they all at one point used the medication. So then when it broke off and there was a placebo arm on it, they kept... 9% of that weight loss. Got it. Okay. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yep. 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 Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the studies really do show that you gain all the weight back. And so that's something to be conscientious of. But again, you have to look at any diet. With every single diet, if you stop doing the diet, you will gain your weight back. Okay. So this should not be looked at as a diet or as a magic shot that will just make you lose weight and never gain it back. That is not how it works. This has to be a tool and part of a lifestyle change. So if you maintain your changes in your lifestyle that has helped you lose the weight, then I think you can maintain your weight loss. And especially if you focus on doing the right things at the right time and not losing that muscle mass will have a huge effect as well. Yeah, there's not a single medication on the market that changes your metabolism and your weight forever. So when you get asked that question, it's like there is nothing that is going to do that. You have to change your lifestyle. Now, when I took the medication, I was able to lose eight pounds. I lost it pretty pretty quickly. And I have been able to maintain that. Now, every once in a while, I might take a shot here and there, but really I have not used it in a while. So I don't need to lose any more than than the eight pounds that I lost. So I had a good response with not regaining that weight back. And, you know, the other option we give to people is if you have the goal of stopping the medication, we're supportive to help you do that and find ways to maintain the weight loss without it. Some people really do well with it and have struggled with weight their whole life and prefer to stay on it either at a lower maintenance dose or at the dose that they've lost their weight on. So, again, personalized care to figure out what the right thing is for the right person. I do have to say, I noticed that when on the medication, the stomach bloating that women in particular experience, it was non-existent on the medication. Like I couldn't believe how much better I felt in that regard. So I really did feel good on the medication. So the next question that we get, is there a certain diet I should follow and what nutrient intake goals do I need to have? Yeah, we touched on this a little bit. There's not one specific diet I put everybody on. I have my own biases on what a diet should be. I was thinking about this conversation, and you probably remember the last time me and you were out to dinner together. You were sitting next to me. You were eating salmon because you typically eat a fish-forward diet. 
I was eating steak because that's what I would choose if I go out to eat. And Manpreet, our other provider, was sitting across from us eating her vegetarian option. And we were joking at the end of it because we were all trying to get each other to try our food (laughs) because we all think our diet is the best. (laughs) And that example just, I think, is common for what we all experience. We all think we're doing the right thing. There's not one right thing, okay? Some people do really well on more of a seafood diet. Other people do better on a little bit of more of a carnivore diet. I think, honestly, omnivore eating all types of food is probably best for most people. So I think the one thing that I advise people on that is bad for everybody is processed food, of course. So trying to not get so much things out of packages, boxes, bags, trying to eat whole foods. So fruits, vegetables, your proteins from meat sources, not from, you know, the impossible burger. It's like <laughs> the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. We won't get into that conversation today. Yeah. Uh, but kind of focusing on whole foods and kind of listening to your body on on what you need because this medication I think does make you more in tune with you're at a party and there's a whole table full of food and normally you would just continue grazing. But when you're on this medication, most people just get their plate, they eat that, and they're done, which is great. Yep. Okay, so next question is, what is visceral fat versus body fat percentage versus BMI? Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit too. BMI, body mass index, is just height versus weight. That is all it is calculating. I don't like it using it for the individual. It is on the printout that we use, but even... People in the military where the military used to use BMI a lot and say for your checkout or I I don't know what they call it, you have to be at this BMI, but even the military is now starting to go away with that and look at body fat percentage and some other markers. But let's just pause there just maybe to highlight how behind the industry is. I mean, aren't these medications to be considered, quote, obese to or overweight to use them? They're going off of BMI? Yeah, yeah, they they definitely are. So this is a big problem. When you go to your regular doctor, they're looking at your BMI and telling you your health based off of the BMI or the weight. And just like you and Dr. Yablonski talked about in previous podcasts, you have to use your eyeballs as a practitioner. You have to look at the person in front of you. Sometimes their weight, their body fat percentage, their BMI, maybe everything is all normal, but the person sitting in front of you has a big old beer belly. And you still want to address that because that is not good for their general health. So yeah, that is a big problem on both sides of the scale, right? With someone who's maybe underweight and told that they're normal and actually is having some negative health implications because of that, or they're overweight and they're not being addressed because their BMI is pretty normal, but maybe they're under muscled and over fat. So are there some people that are resistant to this medication? Yeah, there's definitely some people that do not lose weight with it. So you see this a lot in the diabetic population when you're using this in standard practice for diabetes. People are on the highest dose and they don't feel anything on the appetite suppression, but maybe their A1C does improve. It is helping with that glucose-insulin interaction that's occurring. But pretty uncommon, I think, in the general population, but it does happen there as well. So even if you're not diabetic and you don't have a ton of weight to lose, Some people just aren't responding as much as what you think. So one option is if you're on semaglutide and you're upping, upping, upping the dose and you're not seeing results, we can switch to trazepatide, which is a little bit of a different compound. It's a GLP-1 and a GIP. Some people respond better with that. Some people have more side effects or less side effects with one compound versus the other. So those are all things to consider. But yeah, no one medication works for everybody, unfortunately. And this field of medication is like a ever-growing area. So it'll be interesting to see as we progress, there's going to be a ton of new medications that are going to be hitting the market that are derived from the initial very first GLP-1 to ever be on the market. And like you said, the trisopatide yeah. is a GIP as well. And I know there's a handful of others. So just maybe in closing, what else do you want to say about the medication? What are you excited about of the medication? What's your overall take here since you have a lot of clinical experience with it? Yeah, I think the most exciting thing, one of the articles I was reading recently was that in the past, prior to these being approved for weight loss, the best option was surgery. And we know that bariatric surgery has 
some potential negative implications. One, you have to go under surgery. Two, you have some nutrient deficiencies. It doesn't always work long term. And there is some articles questioning, is bariatric surgery going to be over with? Are these going to replace it? So I think that's really interesting and really exciting. And the applicability for multiple conditions as well. This is being studied for addiction disorders. Again, doesn't work for everybody, but a lot of people are seeing that in people who are alcoholic or near alcoholic, what you would consider, they are not wanting to drink anymore, which is extremely beneficial for your health or at least drinking. Wouldn't you say that's maybe like the number one thing that we hear is like not having that desire for alcohol? Like how often do you hear that? Yeah, pretty frequently. There's some patients where we're prescribing this and you're really hoping it decreases their alcohol consumption and they come back and they're they're still drinking way they, too they much. They fight <laughs> through it. They fight through it. <laughs> yeah, but I think it is extremely beneficial for those disorders potentially. We'll have to see what additional research shows on that, but also the mental health aspect because a lot of people are giving that feedback as well on just it's making me not feel crazy about my weight and worrying about my weight all of the time and what I'm going to eat next. And some of the other exciting things are just how well these medications work, not just for how you look and how you feel, but for the long-term health implications, decreasing risk of cardiovascular disease from the cholesterol and blood sugar standpoint and kind of the underlying things that are occurring with weight loss. Okay. Awesome. As always, I'll attach all this information in the show notes. Anna, thank you for being on the show today. I know you have patients to get back to. I hope everybody has a great day. And just a reminder to please rate, follow, and share the show. Thank you. 